the past two or three years on um, availability and manageability in large content and cloud providers. And when I say content and cloud providers, think Google, Amazon, Facebook, um, companies like that. Um, when, I, when I'm talking about net availability, I mean um, how long the network stays up and to, and it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that availability is one of the biggest problems that large content providers face today. Um, what they're trying to do, so many of you might know sort of the basics of availability and how availability is measured. It's measured in terms of the number of nines. So if I have three nines availability, it means that my, my network or system is up for 99.9% .9 of the time. Companies now are pushing for their entire networks to be available for four nines or five nines. What that means is that if you're pushing for four nines availability, your network can be down for about four minutes in a month. If you're pushing for five nines availability, your network can be down for 24 seconds in a month. Okay. Now, availability, these kinds, of, um, th these kinds of numbers are important because Content providers tell their customers, this is the kind of service, this is the kind of availability you're going to receive. Question. Why do you use an I ace? Is a I second? Sorry, why is the why nines? Nine. Uh, so the nines, four nines means the network is available for 99.99%. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, so at large content providers, why is network availability a challenge? Right. So. Uh, most of us have used the phone system, and availability is high in the phone system, right? But cloud and content providers, availability is a significantly different um, ballgame. In part because these networks are evolving significantly. So this is a chart from a talk I gave several years ago about how Google, Google's network, um, there's a very nice paper on this from many, many years ago, showing how the Google's network evolved uh, over a decade. And and the x-axis is time, the y-axis is capacity. So they've been trying to build larger and larger capacity data center networks for many, many years now. At the same time, what's happening is as they try to build these data center networks, they're also building a fair bit of additional software and capabilities. And so their software base is also evolving. And the reason those two are, um, and when you do this, when you're changing the hardware, when you're changing the software, you're going to introduce bugs. You're going to disrupt, uh, disrupt existing software. And that results in failure. Right. Now, the reason they do this, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it, is that their demand is increasing. So if you think about all of these companies, what they do is that almost every quarter they're introducing a new service, or they're using, introducing a modified version of the service. They're also scaling to billions and billions of users. And so their demands and their network are, are growing significantly. To deal with that, they've been building very large networks. So this is a, a, a picture um, of what's publicly known about Google's networks. So Google has a bunch of different data centers. And those data centers are connected through <coughs> by a wide area network, by two wide area networks that span the globe. The first one is called B4. And the second one is called them. So the network is, they, if you think of what these large companies are doing, they're running some of the largest networks in the world. Now, when you run a very large network, and this is a, 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 a story that, that, they, that these large network providers tell often, something in the network is going to fail. Even if you have very reliable components, some aspect of the network, uh, there's going to be a failure somewhere in the the other thing that happens in these networks is that there is very high management complexity. So when I say, I'll say a little bit more about what management complexity means, but think about when you have to change a network, <coughs> you're performing kind of a management operation. And so these are the two main reasons why complexity is, why the network um, starts, why there are failures, why availability is a significant challenge. Right. Yes, question. Yes. Can you give us a sense of how big these networks are? I mean, how many nodes? Yeah, so those are numbers that are not publicly known. But just think of a, um, just think of their backbone networks as, as being equivalent to a global ISP. So in terms of reach, right? So 
their, uh, their, their footprint is entirely across the globe, across Americas, both North and South, Europe and Asia. Okay. So that's how they think. And that includes both their wide area networks and their data centers. So um, now, in, for the rest of the talk, I need to give you a little bit of background. So most of you, if you've done some networking, you will know that there are these terms called data plane and control plane. The data plane is what, what sends your traffic. The control plane is what figures out where to send and how to send the traffic. And then there is something called the management plane, which, is, which consists of both software and people who are managing the network. Now, what does it mean to manage the network? Well, it means whenever you connect a data center to the network, you're managing, you're, you're performing what's called a management plane operation or a management operation. Whenever you're upgrading routers um, or, uh, or any kind of software, you're performing a management operation. And whenever you need to perform these management operations, you need to sometimes remove links and switches from the routers, from the network, right? That's called draining and undraining. Right? So you need to manually remove some links from, the, from operation, you ma need to manually remove some switches from, from work. Okay. So um, in some work, and some of these steps can take several days and so forth. So in some work that, um, that I did uh, a while ago, um, let me skip this slide, um, some work that I did a while ago in analyzing failures that occur inside of Google, um, I actually found that 70% of these failures occur when a management plane operation is in progress. So when someone is touching the network, um, there, there's likely to be a failure inside the network. Okay. And the reason is that when someone touches the network, they're reconfiguring the network, they're, they're starting to cause traffic to flow in unanticipated directions, which leads to failures. And, stuff. and so there's a saying um, that most network operators will tell you, is that the network is best during the holidays when no one is touching the network. Right? Because <laughs> when a human touches the network, there are going to be failures. <laughs> um, what we found is that these failures are everywhere. Um, all three networks um, see these failures. Uh, there's really no one place where you can say, aha, if I fix this, my availability is going to go up. And the third thing is that a lot of the failure durations are between 10 to 100 minutes. <coughs> so now you look at these minute, minute numbers and you go back to what I told you about availability. And you can see how far we are from providing the kinds of availability guarantees that come to provide this. Please. Go when you describe, for example, four nines, does that mean that it's not this network is gonna is not gonna be available for all the users for four minutes? Was it for some of the users or Yeah. Okay, so that's a very good question. Is how you define this availability um, and at what granularity do you define this availability? It's a, let me take that question, um, let me just say that that's a little bit of a complicated topic. And then there is a separate question of availability at the service level, which is really what the customer cares about, versus availability at the network level, right? Because at the service level, you can do things like redundancy and mask network failures and so forth. Um, so there are very different ways in which you can define this. You can define the entire network, you can define pairs of data centers, you can define pairs of hosts. And you can define availability with respect to those parameters. And different people have different definitions. But that in itself is a pretty big area to, to, uh, to consider. So this is the setting for my talk, which is um, high availability is pushing the envelope of, of, uh, of designs. And I'm going to be talking about two pieces of work that we did um, yeah, with, sorry, you have a question. Yeah, following on that question. Yes. To what extent, um, you know, so there are many stakeholders when you look at this kind of a large network. There are the end users, there are service providers, there are content providers, etc. And the concept of what's availability and what is the responsibility of these different, you, you know, stakeholders in managing that availability becomes a concern, I would think. Or, it's, it's absolutely you know, What does Google push off to saying, if you provide a service, you're responsible for this? Yes. So I think um, many of these content providers, they provide certain guarantees with respect to the kind of service they're providing. So if, they are, if they're saying, we'll give you this many VMs, they're going, they're going to say, OK, the, this is going to be the availability of the VMs. This is going to be the availability of, the, of, your, um, of the, 
uh, virtual network that these VMs are connected with, something like that. But you're absolutely right that this availability question is a really um, very, very difficult one. And at this point, what we're just looking at is what's the network availability? What can we say about what the network itself does? And we're taking a very simplistic view, which is how do you prevent um, failures from happening? Or can you, uh, can you either mask failures or can you degrade gracefully? What are the ways in which you can, which you can build redundancy, additional redundancy to the system beyond what people have done? And so one line of work, um, I'm going to present two pieces of work today. And feel free, of course, to, again, um, ask as many questions as you'd like. Um, I'm going to present two pieces of work today. The first one talks about how to build availability into wide area network routers. So um, if you're not from the networking world, the word um, WAN means a wide area network. And I'll, I'll give you pictures to give you a feel for what that network looks like. Um, and the second piece I'm going to talk about um, is to understand this, this management complexity. And this is kind of a new area that people are starting to look at. Because people are starting to realize that, oh my god, the cost of managing the network is significant, both in terms of the, you know, sort, sort of the, 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 the monetary cost, but also the implications of management on availability. And this is something, that's a connection that not many people had made until, uh, until recently. And so I'll say a little bit. So let me start with the first piece of work. Um, this is in designing these highly available routers. And to do that, I wanted to give you a sense of what Google's network looks like. And by the way, this is all public knowledge. I'm not revealing anything that's, um, that's new. This is an example, to go back to your question, this is an example of what their B4 network looks like. Okay. Um, and these uh, red dots, they tell you where a data center is. And between those uh, red markers, uh, the blue lines correspond to what we call trunks. Trun think of trunks as, as connections over which traffic flows. But trunks are aggregates of connections. They're, they're groups of, of links between, um, between sites. And typically, trunks are carried on optical fibers that go um, underneath the ocean or across the continent and so forth. Okay. So now you get a sense of the scale of the network. Okay. So, now I'm going to dive a little bit deeper and tell you what one of these routers looks like. So really what we care about in this part of the talk is at these sites you have these routers that are connected by trunks to other routers and they talk to data centers. And so if you have a, a Gmail service, for example, your service runs inside a data center, it's accessing data, it comes out through the router and goes to the user. And then services might run across multiple data centers and so this is how they communicate. Now, inside one of these, you have a router that looks like this. Um, so this is the physical, this picture tells you the physical instantiation of the router, which is in two or three of these big racks. The logical instantiation of the router looks something like this. Right? Um, these trunks are at the bottom of the picture, and um, so there may be a small number of trunks. If you go back to that other picture, each node had maybe three, four, five trunks. And um, the trunks are wired to these routers um, using some wiring method. And this wiring is important for this particular talk, which I will get to in just a second. Um, and then there is, the, there is the entire router itself. Now, um, the router consists of physical chassis like this, like the, uh, like the picture I show here, just to give you a feel for what it looks physically. Um, and what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is rather than look at a very complicated picture like this, is to look at a much simpler picture to sort of develop intuitions. Okay. Now, when we look at this router, um, the, the reason people build routers this way is that these boxes correspond to chips, switching chips that companies make. One of the big companies that makes these kinds of switching chips is Broadcom. Um, and so these switching chips are essentially ch entire, entire switches or routers inside a single chip. And so now you suddenly have the capability of putting together a very large collection of these into a single box or a rack that, that has very large aggregate capacity. 
So if these, each of these links is a, um, you know, is a 10 megabit or a 40 megabit, um, or, or sorry, a, a 10 a, a gigabit or, or a 40 gigabit chip, suddenly you can think of these, this router as having significant capacity on the order of terabits per second. Okay. Now, they use a kind of topology called the CLO topology. And that topology has the following property. It has uh, switches at the upper stage. It has switches in the lower stage. It has internal links. And the defining property of the CLO is that it's what's called non-blocking. So meaning if I throw any traffic at it, um, so here's an example where I'm sending on, um, um, I'm sending between C and A, I'm sending two units of traffic. And the, you're guaranteed that no matter what traffic volume you send inside the network, the, the closed topology can have. So that's, we call this the non-blocking property. Now, um, in order for this non-blocking property to work, the traffic has to be routed in a particular way. And this is called um, ECMP, or equal cost multipath. And so the way this works is that traffic comes up from the trunks and then is equally split in all directions. So if you see what happens inside one of these boxes, um, half a unit of traffic is coming in, and it's split equally one-fourth, one-fourth. And the same happens on the other uh, half a unit of traffic. Okay. So when you do this, um, when you do this, because of the way the network is wired, you're guaranteed that this topology is not blocked, meaning any traffic you throw at it, it'll work. Okay. Now, the key problem <coughs> that happens when you do this is, of course, what happens if there are failures inside? When you have a failure inside, when one of the links goes out, then suddenly the now you can only send one unit of traffic between C and A. Even though you have your, your demand is two, you can only satisfy one unit. So the overall capacity can reduce by half with EC. Now, of course, what you'll observe when you look at this picture is you might say, well, there is significant re re residual capacity in the network. I should be able to, to make use of it. And that's exactly what this talk is about. So Please, the go ahead. Go ahead. premise behind why you're able to leverage the maximum capacity is because it's homogeneous? Um, the, there are two premises. One is the way the topology is wired up, right? And the second is that you're utilizing all of the paths in the network by doing the splitting of the routing. But then there's no homogeneity requirement on the... Oh, well, switches. I'm sorry. Yes. The, the other thing, of course, is that all of the switches are exactly the same. Yes. Good. Okay, so in this work we asked, you know, can we just completely mask all of these um, failures? And, or if we can't mask them, can we degrade gracefully? In other words, if my capacity degrades by, so in this case, there's one link that goes out, and there are probably eight links between them. And so really you're losing half your capacity because one eighth of those links went down. That's not graceful degradation. And so you want to lose capacity proportional to the degree of failure that you have. Now, one interesting insight that um, we made as part of doing this is that what you can do is instead of, on the left-hand side, I show a picture where the trunks are wired in this rather simplistic fashion. And one observation that we made is that perhaps if you wire it differently, okay, then what you can do is that you can leverage what we call early forwarding. Now, if you look at this, if you look at this picture, if I want to send traffic from C to A, the way I've wired it, the traffic has to go up this way. Okay. Whereas if you look at this picture, if I want to send traffic from C to A, some of the traffic can go this way. And that's the key. That's what we call early forwarding. And so you see what we can do here in this case is if we are sending from C to A, you can send some traffic that goes this way, some traffic that goes this way. And so, okay. and so um, early forwarding means instead of all the traffic going up to the upper stages, you're, you're actually forwarding. 
Um, and so compare that with what we used to do before, which is because of ECMP, we had to split this traffic equally, and all the traffic had to go. Oh, now, um, the intuition for why this works is that when you do this, you're reducing what's called upflow. You're reducing the amount of traffic that goes from this stage to this stage, right? Because some of the traffic is forwarded this way. So that way, you're essentially building up residual capacity here to tolerate more failures. By doing, by, by doing this early forwarding, you're sending less traffic here so you can tolerate more failures. So that's the key idea. Question. Um, would this uh, affect the packet order? Like, for example, when you're sending out some data, it would like, mess up the packet order. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. The previous so, one doesn't, but this one does. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so the question is, what about packet ordering? So the, it, the assumption here is that, um, and what we always assume is that you're doing what's called flow hashing, meaning all the packets in the connection are sent in one direction. Okay, so then order it. Question, yes? So how about if the, the wiring fails? I'm sorry, if the what fails? The, the wiring, like, so you, you're using redundant uh, paths yeah. for the wiring, right? So what if that path fails? Uh, if you're using, if you if you have multiple fail, you mean if a, if no, one of those switches here failed, the, the, wide the lower the lower yeah. the external yeah. trunks fail. From the trunk to the oh uh, the yes switch. so the if side. yes absolutely so if the if the trunk if either the lower switches fail or if these trunks fail, then fundamentally you've lost capacity, right? You there's nothing you can do about that. In that case, you want to make sure that you're you can you're still uh, you degrade gracefully. You degrade proportional to the degree of failure. In other words, if you lose one of these links, um, and there are eight of these, then you still want to make sure that your resulting capacity is seven eighths instead of half. Okay. And so um, the, the, the paper doesn't deal with that, but there are ways in which you can do it. Good question. Yes. OK, so you've got the intuition for the fact that um, early forwarding reduces upflow. Um, and so in this example, in the particular example that we showed, using this technique, we can just completely mask. Okay. Now, one thing you might have noticed is that early forwarding needs a slightly different way of sending the traffic. Right? In the previous example, when I showed ECMP, all the traffic <coughs> was split equally. Okay. Now, you have to do a weighted version of ECMP where you're doing unequal traffic splits. So in this particular example, which uh, is for this particular switch we've zoomed in here, your traffic isn't being split or, uh, or the traffic is split in such a way that the weight here is one and the weight here is zero. Okay. So this gets a little bit more complicated. And the reason it gets a little bit more complicated is because um, of the way these switches implement this um, this splitting. So the way the switches implement this splitting is um, essentially when you want to do, if you have a weight of two in one and you have a weight of one in the other, you're going to be using three entries. But if you have a weight of 21 in one and you have a weight of 11 in the other, you're going to be using 32 weight entries. In other words, they are essentially implementing the weighted version by replicating the entries in the switches. And the problem is that these switches have limited table sizes. And so that brings us to, um, oh, the other thing I wanted to say was also that the weights depend on the failure. For example, if a failure happens here, you might decide to route the traffic this way. But if the failure happens here, you clearly have to route the traffic in a very different way. So this brings us to sort of the key questions we address in the paper. The first question is, um, what wiring minimizes the upflow? So I told you that we do this um, fancy wiring. The question is, what wiring minimizes the upflow? And what is the set of weights that we can calculate? Question. Uh, are these uh, splitting decisions uh, uh, takes place locally or uh, the remote control? So the idea is that. Um, the idea is that there is a central controller which com computes these splitting decisions and installs them on the switches, and the switches do the decisions. 
Now, in order to address these two questions, yes, sorry. Such question. quick clarification question. When you have a larger number of weights, does that mean you can split up in a much more granular way? Is that the um, The idea is that uh, if, uh, so in this example, uh -huh. right, if you wanted to have very fine grain control, then the, the point is that you're have, going to have to pay in terms of the table space that you have. Um, and so if there is a way in which uh, you can sacrifice some of this fine grain control and get coarser grain control, you can reduce it. And so that's exactly the game we play in, um, in deciding what the, what the table sizes are. Now, in deciding what the table sizes are, we have to solve a third problem, which is how much capacity is there inside one of these routers when there's a failure? And by the way, we're, we've been talking about single failures, but really there could be multiple concurrent failures. There could be uh, two link failures here, one of these switches could fail, one of these switches could fail. You want to be able to reason about the capacity, you want to be able to reason about these weights. And so in this particular paper, um, we worked on three different contributions. And one, is to essentially understand, to essentially come up with the wiring that gives you the minimum upflow for a given set of trunks. So remember, these trunks are these cables that go between routers um, in the wide area network. And so you know what capacity you want on those trunks. When you want to connect those trunks to the router, you want to figure out how do I wire them. Okay. And so that's the first consideration. Then, once I have the wiring, for a given failure pattern, I try to find out what the effective capacity is. And knowing the effective capacity, I can calculate the forwarding table. Okay. Now, I won't go through a lot of technical detail. I'll maybe talk about the first one in the interest of time, because I also want to touch upon the second piece of work. Um, so let me describe a little bit about this minimal um, upload trunk wiring. Before I do that, the one important thing we do in this, um, in this work is that it turns out that to answer some of these questions, they, these are compute intensive tasks. And so we perform them completely offline. And so there is a fair amount of work that we had to do in order to ensure that all of these steps scale to, um, to very large routers. So uh, as I told you before, routers have sometimes 128 ports, sometimes 512 ports. And so you want these solutions to grow to be able to scale to these uh, large routers. Now, um, the first thing to note uh, in trying to find this upflow is that if you have the same traffic but you have different wiring, you can have completely different upflow. Seems intuitive. It also seems intuitive that if you have different traffic but you have the same wiring, you can have completely different. So these two factors, the traffic and the wiring, determine the degree of upload. Question? Right. Um, and so if you think of casting this as some kind of function, it's a function of wiring and traffic. And fundamentally, what you're interested in is you're interested in trying to find a very good wiring. And one way to characterize that wiring is first to find the wiring, to find the maximal upflow for a given uh, for a given wiring. So let's say I give you a wiring and I ask and I give you and I, I ask you to find the maximum upflow. Now clearly I said that the upflow depends upon the traffic. And so what you have to do is you have to pass this as some kind of a maximization problem across all possible traffic matrices, all possible ways in which the traffic can enter. Now, this turns out to be a problem. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, but the other thing you have to do, really what you're interested in, is you're interested in finding that wiring that has the smallest maximum upload. And so that's our definition of minimum upload. Because even for a given, um, across different wirings, you might have different uploads. And so you're trying to find the, uh, the wiring that gives you the minimum. And so um, when you cast the problem this way, um, 
you essentially, the, the, the big uh, impediment to solving this problem is the fact that the number of traffic matrices is potentially infinite. Right? But what you can observe in this particular setting is that the space of traffic matrices forms a convex polytope. And you can replace the optimization with, a, with the set of extreme traffic matrices. And that simplifies the problem. It makes it much more tractable. So that's the first step, is how you get the optimal one. Okay. Now, we've used similar techniques for calculating the effective capacity and the compact forwarding. I'll skip some of this because I want to spend the rest of the time talking about the, the second piece. And I'll jump directly to talking about the evaluation that we have to give you a feel for what the, um, how much resiliency we were able to achieve. So the way we do this, um, we have several evaluations in the paper. I can, I can talk a little bit more about it uh, offline if people are interested. But the way we went about doing this evaluation is imagine that you have a 128 port router. Um, we were interested in all possible ways in which the, uh, all possible kinds of failures that could happen. And we, if we enumerated all possible combinations of these trunks that you can have. And essentially what we were interested in finding out is for how many, how many concurrent failures is the network able to sustain? And essentially what we found um, is shown in this graph, and let me describe what this graph is, which is on the x-axis, you have the number of concurrent failures. So three means there are three concurrent link failures, and this particular graph we're looking at failures of, that, of those internal links. Okay. The y-axis is a measure of the effective capacity. So one means I can still send any traffic matrix and be able to run. And the different colors correspond to different binnings of the level of upflow. The blue line says I have zero upflow. When I have zero upflow, I can tolerate almost any link failure here. Right? And why is that? Because there's no traffic going up. So even if all those links are down, I'm still good. If I have non-zero upflow, the orange line shows you how much I can tolerate. I can tolerate up to seven concurrent failures, and so forth, right? So the key idea is that we can, no matter what the trunk configuration is, if you have four trunks on a, on a 128 port router, you can actually sustain up to six concurrent failures. Whereas at the beginning of the talk, I told you that existing techniques with a single failure can reduce half the capacity, whereas here, with six concurrent failures, you, um, you can still ensure complete capacity. So essentially what you've done is that you've, you've used up, you've um, leveraged the significant redundancy that exists inside these networks. But you've had to do very clever things in the way you actually route the traffic in order to achieve high capacity. Isn't there also an assumption of how the traffic is coming in? Um, there is an, uh, th yes, so that's a very good question. There is an assumption, and this assumption is true because of the way um, Google designs its, its wide area routing, that the traffic is load balanced on all of the incoming links. So if you have a trunk that is four, four, with four links, then all the traffic is load balanced. That's and then and the same is true for the outgoing traffic. So that possibly goes back down to if your, what, what's generating is, some large storage or whatever that things are striped across or... Yes, exactly. So if you remember, the picture was there's a data center and then there's a router and the routers connect, communicate over the trunk. Mm -hmm. So the storage units are inside the data center. You're generating the traffic and the routers are then striping across. Okay. Yes? Yes. Uh, Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit offline. Um, so the question really had to do with, uh, you know, sort of, is, is it possible to do optical, optical switching in these large data centers? And um, 
the, um, there potentially is a, is a place for optical switching both in the data centers and in the wide area networks. My general sense is it's not there yet because of cost reasons and because of other reasons, reconfigurability and so forth. But we should certainly discuss that offline. The second thing I wanted to uh, plant in your head, um, and this is a somewhat, um, uh, somewhat newer direction that, um, that we've been looking at, is uh, understanding what does it, what's the complexity of managing these networks. I told you at the beginning that management is starting to impact availability. When, when I'm managing a network and I touch the network, it breaks, and that impacts availability. This connection was, you know, people hadn't really thought about it too much until more recently when, when they're starting to think about um, high availability designs. Okay. Now, some of you, if you worked in the, in the networking space, know that the way people build these networks is using these very large uh, network topology designs. And basically, there are two or three kinds of these designs. Um, one of them is very structured. Um, these are the CLO topologies. And uh, inside each one of these nodes is one of these Broadcom switching chips that I told you about. Um, another class of networks is a very random kind of graph. Um, random graph has this nice expansion property that gives you very high capacity designs. And the third is a similar expander type network with, uh, which is a little bit more structured. So there are these different qualitatively different ways in which people think about building these data centers. And a lot of the prior work has focused on what's the cost and what's the capacity of these networks. In other words, how do I build a high capacity network at, the po at possibly the lowest cost? But given what I said about how management impacts how you do, um, how you run the network, a third dimension that's important is management complexity. But the hard thing about this is it's hard to say what, it, what does it even mean for something to be complex from a management perspective. Right? So you need some kind of metric to decide um, what management complexity is, and I'll get to that in just a second. But the question we asked in this paper is, how does com the complexity of managing the data center depend on the topology? And our focus is what's called life cycle management. And I'll tell you what life cycle management is. Um, and so even if you do networking um, there's a very high chance that you might not have thought about all of the things I'm going to tell you about. Um, the first thing that these very large companies do when they build out these data centers is that they deploy them. The deployment of a data center, the picture on the right actually shows the physical realization of the data center. It's a, think of it as a large warehouse. There are hundreds and hundreds of racks. So you have to put servers in the racks, you have to run cables and so forth. All of that takes time. And so that's a management operation. And we want to quantify the complexity of that. A second aspect of life cycle management, and here life cycle means the life cycle of the data center. A second aspect of it is expansion. Once I've built something, once I've built this warehouse scale network, I want to expand it. Um, because, for example, I'm, I might not have the capital to build the entire network at once, so I build a quarter of the network. The next year, I expand it by a another quarter and so forth. So these are the two important operations that people do on these networks. Okay. Now, deployment is important because deployment complexity delays service rollouts. And this is a graph from um, a Google paper that shows how the traffic in increased in the span of five years by a factor of 50. Right. When your traffic is increasing almost on a monthly basis, you're going to have to figure out how to expand the network quickly. And anything that slows down your either your deployment or expansion causes you to lose revenue. And it's the same case. When you're expanding, as I'll tell you a little bit later, when you're actually expanding the network, you have to bring a little part of the network down so that you can rewire the network. Right? And, um, and, and if that is complex, then again, you're losing availability. So this work actually looked at three different questions. Right? One is, and, and this is the somewhat interesting aspect of it, which is, how do you characterize the management complexity of the network? And quite likely, this is the part that I will mostly 
get through in the time we have. There are two other parts to it. One is how does topology structure affect the management of trust? And there we find that existing topology classes you know, are good by, by some measures of complexity or are not good by other measures of complexity. And so we came up with a topology design that is good in terms of both cost, in terms of cost capacity, and management of trust. So I was wondering if failure is also something that should be considered for uh, management complexity. If yes. something goes down, how difficult yes. is it to do? Absolutely, absolutely. So that's why our focus was on life cycle management complexity. There is a, a uh, you, there are other aspects of complexity, which is when a failure happens, how complex is it to isolate the failure? How complex is it to fix the failure? Uh, what is the, what is what people call the blast radius of the failure? What is the extent, you know, of the, uh, how, mu how much does a single failure affect the rest of the failure? Those are things we haven't looked at, but absolutely important uh, open questions. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll start by talking about how to characterize the management capacity. And this is kind of a, this was kind of fun for us because um, we had to start thinking and looking at exactly how, to, how are these networks built. What do people do when they deploy or expand a network? And what they're doing is that they're packaging parts of the network into racks. They're wiring those racks. They're placing those racks on the floor like you saw. They're rewiring them. And the things they play with, the, the elements of, uh, in all of these tasks, are things like these switching chips or things like these racks. Um, there is, a, there is a beast called a patch panel, which I will introduce you to, uh, which turns out to be important, and there's something called a cable tray. So these are all interesting components that people put together as they're building this. Okay. And what we did was we went and looked, and the student did a great job looking at, there are plenty of YouTube videos that show how to put together these data center kinds of things, and we got intuitions. We tried to understand in detail how um, these topologies are deployed and expanded. And our goal was to derive the, the metrics that capture the, the complexity of these topologies. So let me start by explaining the first thing you do. So um, the first thing you do is package your network. And your network has two kinds of entities in it. One is a switch, and one is a server. Right? You're, you're building a data center. Data center has many servers. That's where all your services run. That's where Google runs Gmail and so forth. That's where Facebook runs its um, uh, you know, social network software and things like that. And your switches and servers are split into racks. Some of these racks are composed entirely of switches. Some of them are composed entirely of servers, except for one switch at the top, which is called the top of the rack switch. That's the switch that connects up to the rest of the network. Right. So one simple measure of complexity of the network is the number of switches. In the and those topology designs I showed you, they all have different numbers of switches. So it's a measure of, um, it tells you how much work you have to do to set up the network when you know how many switches you have. Because when you know how many switches you have and you know the rack size, you also know how many servers you can, uh, you can The second important thing that you can you had a question, Nani? I'm just curious that is this usually something like a power of two or something? Uh, for the in terms of the number of ratios. switches. No, it depends. It depends on the it depends on the rack sizes that you choose and things like that. And the the number of switches depends upon the topological connectivity. So if you have a structured topology with lots of layers, you're going to get. Um, I mean, uh, you're you're going to get many more switches than if you had a completely random graph where you have much more. Connectivity. So we get to. Some of that. Wiring is another big issue, which is that people, when they wire the network, right, they um, inside the rack you can have short wires; those are cheap. But outside the rack, you have to connect them up this way with long optical fibers. Okay. And optical fibers are expensive, um, and you also have to run them on cable trays. So this is a picture of what that looks like. So you see. Um, all of the, these, this thing at the top is essentially a cable tray where all the wires are running. And here's how you pull the wires from the racks to the top of the cable tray. So the main wiring complexity comes from these inter-rack works. Now, um, there are, 
if you think of the way people design the data centers, here's what the logical connectivity looks like. This is, of course, a completely terrible way to draw these wires. And what people actually do is they um, bundle these wires into what are called cable bundles. Okay? So now you see these nice um, aggregations uh, of, of these bundles. And so a cable bundle is a fixed number of identically linked fibers, identical linked fibers between two network devices. And you can characterize bundles by different bundle types. So you can have one bundle type that has 100 fibers and goes one meter, another bundle type that has 200 fibers and goes 20 meters. Right? So those are two different bundle types. And intuitively, bundling is a measure of complexity. So if I have a topology like this, I can connect them up this way. And you'll notice that all of them are, um, there are 16 individual fibers of four different types of lengths. They all probably have the same capacity. So there are four different bundle types. Right? Whereas if I could connect them up this way with a device that sits in between, and this is a device I haven't told you about, then I get, this looks much easier to deploy, right, visually and physically. So that's the intuition, which is that another metric of complexity is the number of bundle types. Now, I haven't, I wanted to tell you about this device in between. This is what's called a patch panel. And so a patch panel is something that lets you connect up these ports here and then wire them in any way you want to. So another measure of the complexity of how you manage the network is the number of patch panels. Okay. So this is how we went about the process, which is we looked at how people deployed this. And when you read about networks, you probably don't hear about all of these devices that you have to deal with when you actually build a network. But it turns out that when you have to build a network, the, this is the complexity. You have to look at racks. You have to look at the number of switches the number of patch panels, and the number of bundle types. Right. Now, um, the, the second thing we did was to look at expansion metrics. And expansion is this idea where you have a data center on, on your left, um, and you're now wanting to add more capacity. To them. One way to do that is to completely close down this data center and then rewire everything. But people don't do that because you lose a lot of capacity. So what they do is that they let some of these links work, but rewire a subset of these links. Okay. And so this is called expand or upgrade in place. So these links are carrying traffic, but these other links, the hashed links, are not carrying traffic. And um, so you have to reduce the capacity. The game you're playing is reduce the capacity of the network a little bit, let it carry traffic, then expand. Then the next step, you take out other links and you rewire them. So you perform the expansion in steps. And so one simple measure of complexity is the number of expansion steps. Okay. Is it possible to treat the expansion as a separate data center and then just connect? It, it, is it possible to treat the expansion as a separate data center and just connect them? Yes, you can. But what happens is that um, you then lose the aggregate capacity of that data center. Yeah. So uh, in other words, if they're already connected, then they, either you have to reserve some ports on them and then connect them up separately. Um, but typically what happens is that you're, this part of the data center, you're deploying new anyway. So this is not connected. Um, and the reason for expansion is often cost reasons. So you often don't have two data centers that you already have that you can then link up together. Um, there is another complexity measure for expansion, which is how many links do you have to rewire? This is a complex picture. I won't go through this. But essentially, when you go through this exercise, you come up with the fact that there are these different kinds of metrics. And what really happens, and this is the second step of the argument, is that existing topologies, I told you about three different classes of topologies, but in this table I'm showing you two of them. So this is the more structured topology, this is the more random topology. One of them is good by a couple of measures, the other one is good by a few of the other measures. Right? So neither of them is really perfect for from management complexity standpoint. And so the rest of the talk 
um, talks about why some topologies are good by some of these metrics and why they're not. And, um, and then goes through and designs, so I'm going to skip all of this in the interest of time and to open some time for questions. Um, the rest of the talk talks about designing a new topology that is good both in terms of capacity and in terms of management capacity. And the design of that topology derives from these pr principles or intuitions. And at the end of the talk, I have some evaluations that I'm happy to um, talk to people about that show that the, the particular kind of topology we designed, the fat click, is actually pretty good in terms of the number of switches, in terms of the number of patch panels, in terms of the number of bundle types, and all of the metrics. So the, the key here is that um, people haven't really looked at thinking about how a design of something impacts the manageability of that thing. Right? Um, and that's a really important shift in thinking that has to happen. If, if management impacts availability and you want high availability, then you have to start thinking about when I build this piece of software, piece of hardware, whatever it is, I need to think about what, it, what is it going to cost me to manage that system? Right. And so we call it designing for manageability. And that's sort of a, a newish direction that people can start thinking about um, in, in, in coming up, especially with network systems at large scale, where these you know, uh, large providers have these very, very large failures, often caused by humans touching, touching the network. I mean, the other way to solve the problem is to add um, more, more and more layers of software that help you manage the network, but that has its own problems. Okay. So um, I'll stop at this point and I'm happy to take questions. I just wanted to highlight um, and thank my, acknowledge my collaborators who, who, did, uh, who did most of the work. Question. Yes. How common is it to have um, not available networks due to actually management problems? Um, so, uh, so, we, in the study that I mentioned, um, the number that comes out is 70% of the failure. So I, I can tell you a little bit about the study. The study was, we looked at all the big failures that had happened at Google. So whenever Google has a failure, they, they do this process by which they do a post-mortem on that failure, especially for large failures, because they don't want the failures to be repeated. So they had all of these reports, and we looked at all of these big failures. 70% of those failures happened when someone was doing a management operation inside the network. Right? So this is a huge issue for them. Um, and um, now, not all of those failures were, were directly, result, directly resulted from the management operation itself. People had done the right management operation. But in some of those cases, the fact that when you're doing the management operation, you're reducing the capacity exposes some other kind of failure, some other kind of vulnerability inside the network, and that causes the network to work. Yes? Has anybody suggested, that, say, a hybrid topology of, like, the jellyfish and the other one? Yeah, that so... The the yeah, um, sorry, yes, of course I can. Um, so the question was, has anybody suggested a hybrid topology? And in some sense, the topology we came up with is effectively that. Um, so let me show you the, the topology that we have. Um, there are two key ideas um, in, in the, the Clo topology is very structured, very regular. So it has pieces that look all the same and they're connected in roughly the same way. The jellyfish topology has the property that you have um, what's called an expander property, which is that you, you have significant connectivity between nodes so that with a small number of nodes you can have high capacity. Um, and so this tries to marry the, the, both of those worlds. It has a, um, a clique network, which is an expanded graph. And then it has built in this regular structure, this hierarchical structure. And that's essentially the insight we came up with in order to try to get the best. Yeah. More questions? important is it to maximize utilization of network capacity in this case? Yeah. Would it make sense, for example, you know, I mean, in other systems we have things like primary backup. 
So every time you expand your network, have some piece that is redundant that you can expand into kind of seamlessly, and as you're expanding, add the next backup. Um, no, so that that's a good question. Be, uh, you know, like, like security and um, every question in availability comes down to a trade-off between cost and, and the degree of availability that you want and the complexity that you're willing to put into the system. Right? So if cost were not a consideration, of course, you could build completely redundant uh, things. I think um, increasingly, because of the high competition between these content providers, cost is, is and will be a, an important factor in these designs. And so cost of the hardware, cost of the software, cost of the overhead. And so, so there is redundancy. When there is redundancy, you want to be able to ut utilize it effectively. And in some cases, it, it makes sense to utilize the network as much as possible, especially when the cost structure is, is important. So for example, I showed you the wide area network that they have. The wide area links are supremely expensive. And so you want to be able to use those links as much as possible. So m many of the designs are trying to drive those wide area links to a very high, as, as high utilization as possible. Um, and so then that leaves you with very little margin for error. So, it's a, it's a very delicate game that, that you're playing. Question? Let's thank the speaker.